So let me encourage people to uh, find a seat, and we're going to begin our program. I'm Mike McPherson, president of the Spencer Foundation, and it's truly a pleasure to welcome our, our friends and colleagues, many of you who've been associated with Spencer for many years, some who are newly joining the kind of extended Spencer family. Uh, and AERA is, provides the occasion for us to, to get together, to think about important issues together, and honor some of the, the uh, recent awardees from the Spencer Foundation, and to have a big, enjoyable party, all of which are very good things. We're going to begin this evening uh, with the presentation of our exemplary dis dissertation awards. And I have the pleasure and duty of introducing Paul Gorin, uh, who uh, coordinated the uh, selection process for the EDA awardees uh, with an excellent selection committee. This, Paul is now the director, or is it executive director? Some kind of director of uh, uh, the Consortium on Chicago School Research. And, uh, uh, we really congratulate him on this uh, fabulous opportunity for him, and I think also great opportunity for the city of Chicago and for the University of Chicago. Uh, CCSR is uh, uh, the national leader in, in pioneering real partnership between academic research and genuine problems of schools. And uh, the this outfit functions as an example around the nation and makes huge contributions, uh, both to our understanding of education and to improving education in Chicago. So it's great that he has that opportunity. The sad part is he, even Paul apparently can't do that and be the senior vice president of the Spencer Foundation at the same time. Uh, for the last nine years, Paul has been of enormous service to our foundation to the educational research community, and ultimately, more important, to future generations of students in, and learners of all kinds in the United States and around the world. And uh, his leadership, as really probably everybody in this room knows, has been uh, just off the charts. As, and uh, his communication skills are unparalleled uh, in many ways. So I want to ask Paul, before he comes up, to stand for a moment and for us to give him a round of applause for his fabulous service. Now, as I said, this will be Paul's last official act as president of the Spencer Foundation. His next official interaction, president, wow, congratulations, Paul. His, his next official act in relationship to the Spencer Foundation will be to try to work us over for a grant. And Paul, I can't wait. <laughs> so come on up and uh, introduce the fellows. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. You sure look great today. And uh, <laughs> that suit is just so fantastic. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, and I love Mike's uh, words uh, that uh, I have great communication skills. My kids tell me I talk too much, and uh, as I think some of my colleagues at the Spencer Foundation may think as well. Let me uh, take a moment of personal privilege and thank Mike McPherson. Uh, many of the board members from the Spencer Foundation are here, and many of my staff colleagues. Um, yeah, the, the pleasure of working in this, uh, this organization, uh, is, I, I can't express with words, um, and it's a uh, uh, the, what we're doing tonight is really the great honor, which is to honor the work that's done in the research community um, uh, through support that, that we're able to give. But I thank you for your leadership, our board members for their leadership, um, and especially my staff colleagues who have worked with me and tolerated my uh, ability to communicate and have bad jokes all the time. Um, so for the past several years, we've been honoring um, exemplary dissertations of uh, the Spencer Foundation. Uh, we've uh, uh, invited folks who have competed for our dissertation fellowship program uh, to uh, uh, to compete for for this honor, um, and we've uh, uh, worked very hard to try to honor folks who are working across education and the broad disciplines related to education and learning. Um, I worked with a absolutely fabulous. Uh, 
committee, a, a group of uh, folks on, on the selection committee this year, um, as we rolled up our sleeves and read the, we actually read the dissertations. We read the dissertations, which are pretty amazing. And we read your three dissertations, you know, excellent as they are. Um, Ruben Donato from the University of Colorado, Elizabeth Moje from uh, the University of Michigan, Rick Hanishek from the Hoover Institute at Stanford, Pam Walters from the University of Indiana, Dan Koretz from Harvard, and Meredith Phillips from UCLA. And I know several of the colleagues are here, and I just want to give them a round of applause. It, it strikes me, these are fantastic colleagues, as are all of you who participate on our review panels at Spencer. It is so marvelous, the work, the time, the commitment that you do, um, and, and we really value that uh, um, tremendously. These uh, awards, um, along with a wonderful certificate, the awardees will uh, get a, a check for $2,500 and have the opportunity to apply for one of the Spencer Small Grants. Um, uh, well, you have the opportunity to apply. You got to get the application in. You get the application in. We would hope to uh, award you a grant for up to twenty-five thousand uh, uh, dollars upon uh, uh, upon receiving your application. So we have three award winners, and I want to call them up. And uh, Mike, I think you're going to hand uh, the certificate. The first is uh, Jal Mehta, who's a sociologist. Uh, he's an assistant professor at Harvard, and he wrote the transformation of American education policy. 1980 through 2001, Ideas and the Rise of Accountability Policies. Chao Mehta. The next award goes to Judy Scott Clayton, who is an economist uh, and an assistant professor at Teachers College. And she wrote, Understanding America's Unfinished Transformation, Three Essays on the Economics of Higher Education. And last but not least, uh, Michael Kiefer, who is an assistant professor at Teachers College and uh, in language and literacy. And he wrote The Development of Morphological Awareness and Vocabulary Knowledge in Adolescent Language Minority Learners and Their Classmates. <laughs> and I. One of the great joys of working at Spencer is when we call all of you and to say, hey, you got a grant or you got an award. And I can tell you that all three had very high, were very high on the woohoo level. So please join me in congratulating all three of our award winners. So we have also in recent years introduced uh, a new feature to the to Spencer's evening at, at AERA, which is the, the Spencer Lecture, which this year is in the form of a discussion. When we first thought up this idea, we uh, uh, thought that Spencer was known for its reception. It should be known as it is, of course, for its, its substantive thinking as well. And I referred to this uh, evening as now having shrimp and substance. But I have a hunch that it's quite possible that in the in the light of the current recession, we're still going to have substance, <laughs> but I'm not so sure we're going to have shrimp. However, we will have a wonderful reception immediately following, following uh, uh, this, this evening's discussion. And uh, as you know, this year we're focusing on data, on its uses and its limits in improving education, clearly a topic of first-rate importance uh, for, for all of us who are concerned about education. And uh, David Leonhardt of the New York Times is going to manage our conversation. Uh, and I have the pleasure of saying a few words about David. Uh, I think most of you are aware of David's economic scene column, which appears on the Wednesday business pages, and which might be thought to be really a business column. But it's not. It's really an economics column thinking about economics as a social science and what we can learn from that uh, social science about big issues in American society. And I would go further than that. It really is a social science column. And if you think about the contributions that David has made to major subjects like healthcare reform, where I think his wonderful articles had a real influence on the quality of the, the debate, on the current issues of financial reform, and 
from time to time in the past, and we hope even more often in the future, uh, writings about education as well. David applies evidence and careful reasoning to major social problems more thoughtfully and more consistently than any other working journalist that I know. His column is, I think, the best reason to read the New York Times on Wednesday. And in my opinion, it's the best reason to read the New York Times, period. It's truly an honor for me to welcome David Leonhardt to our occasion. I guess. Thank you so much, Mike. Is my mic now on? Yes? Good. That was extremely kind. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to introduce our uh, two panelists tonight, uh, and then I'm going to uh, moderate the uh, first uh, part of the discussion, and uh, you all are going to moderate the, the second part of the discussion. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is there should be cards around that allow you all to write questions down. And so at any point, write down a question and just pass it to any side of the aisle, um, and just leave them on the floor, right on the aisles there. And there are folks who have agreed to sweep up and down and pick up the questions. Um, and uh, uh, you don't need to write your name. Uh, we will consider questions without names. But uh, if you don't care either way, please do write your name. And we'll say who it comes from. Um, uh, I'm just going to start by, uh, by thanking Mike and Spencer for having me here. It's a real thrill. I am the black sheep in my family. I'm pretty much the only person not in education. Uh, my mom spent years working at the Merck Institute for Science Education. My dad runs a high school and on and on and on. My sister, my wife, my brother-in-law, pretty much everyone except me is involved in education. So uh, coming to a place like this lets me go home and tell them that I really am involved in the family business, <laughs> which is quite nice. Uh, and it's, it's particularly nice to be here um, to, to hear these awards announced, which I didn't know, uh, because um, Judy's paper is one of the two most enjoyable economic research papers that I've read in the last five years. I'll tell you the other during questions if you want to know it. Uh, so now I'm going to make sure that I get the other two. Uh, the one, actually, I I've only read one third of her dissertation, which is the part on West Virginia. But not only is it fascinating, but um, don't take this as an insult. It's unusually well written for an academic paper. <laughs> um, uh, so let me introduce uh, the two other folks, the reason you all are here. Um, and what I thought I would do is tell you just a couple of quick things about them that you may not know, because to some extent, uh, to use the cliche, they don't need any introduction here or anyone else, any, anywhere else. They're obviously Dick Murnane and Howard Gardner are incredibly distinguished social scientists um, uh, who've contributed great things um, to the academy over the years. The theory of multiple intelligences, incredibly important work about the role of education and, and computers in society. And my guess is, is you know all that. Um, uh, they both happen to be professors at Harvard University. So first, let me tell you a couple things you may not know about Howard. Um, he describes his being, himself as being part of the third wave of immigrants from Nazi Germany, the first two being those who fled as adults and those who escaped as children. He was in the third wave. His parents arrived in the United States, as it happens, on November 9, 1938, which was the night of Kristallnacht. Um, from Germany, and they settled in Scranton, where he grew up. Um, and I want to read you his description of himself as a boy in Scranton. A dark-haired, slightly chubby, bespeckled boy of above-average height, who walked and moved somewhat awkwardly. I was a studious sort. I loved to read. I was curious about many things, and eagerly peppered older children, teachers, and adults with questions. The more difficult, the better. I also liked to write, and by the age of seven or so, I was a journalist, publishing my own home and school newspapers. Um, I love that because I know someone else who did that at age seven. Uh, the difference being Howard outgrew it <laughs> for the benefit of all of us. So please welcome Howard up to the stage. Thanks. Um, Dick Murnane, I found out in the course of getting ready for this, is himself a former high school teacher. Um, he spent three years teaching math, a year in Houston, a year in Baltimore, and a year in Washington. Um, I, I just asked him why he spent three years in three different cities and whether there was something about uh, something maybe we, we needed to know about his teaching abilities. He said no, and anyone who's had him as a teacher knows that. In fact, I, I heard his teaching praised earlier. Uh, he said he was chasing a woman. Um, uh, I asked him how it worked out, and they're celebrating their 40th anniversary next year. So it worked out quite well. 
Um, as many of you know, his frequent co-author is Frank Levy, an economist at MIT, and they've really done wonderful work that is, that, um, uh, is both outside game and inside game, both uh, looks at things from 35,000 feet um, to mix metaphors, and also really gets down involved uh, and, and looks at individual schools. Um, uh, and I asked, uh, I asked Frank what he could tell me about Dick for this, and uh, he said that he's just one of the finest people he's ever worked with, that he's incredibly serious about, about doing just the best possible econometrics that he can, but he's also very serious about actually going into schools. And it seems to me that that's exactly the kind of thing that we need more of, right? We need, we need people who are willing to cross these disciplinary um, boundaries and, and really figure out what can work. Frank said the only downside is that in all their time together driving around to schools, um, Dick's failing is that he is completely incapable of reading a map, and so that they've frequently gotten lost while trying to visit these schools. So um, I hope Dick can now find his way to the <laughs> stage. <laughs> We're going to start with very short introductions um, from each of them. And, um, then we're going to have a little discussion. And, and again, don't wait for the end in order to uh, write your questions down. Do it at any point and just drop them on the floor, and they'll be swept up. So with that. Thanks, David. And good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Good. Um, well, my friend Mike McPherson has variously described this evening as duel in the Wild West or the Denver food fight. Um, but I actually think of it as three economists ganging up on one awkward, lapsed psychologist. <laughs> I don't want to disappoint you, and I'm going to tell you up front that Dick Murnane is a friend and colleague, not for 40 years, but for uh, several decades. Um, I agree with most of what he says. I've learned a great deal from him. I would say he's made me data wise, and that uh, tonight he's going to make me data wiser. Um, what I'm going to do, though, is to explore what I'm going to call the middle-scopic level of analysis. You've heard of the macroscopic and the microscopic, and um, we will eventually get to the, macros to the middle-scopic. That's actually a word. If I looked it up in Google, there's 75 entries under middle-scopic. Um, but my framing before we get to the middle-scopic is going to be about the macroscopic and the microscopic. So first, macroscopic. And this has to do with the kind of society which um, I would like to live in. And I have three exhibits. The first one is the community of Reggio Emilia, where I've been going for about 30 years. As many of you know, it's widely considered to have the best schools for young children in the world. But whenever an American goes there, the first question that he or she asks is, what's the test scores and what happens after the kids leave the schools? And the adults in Reggio now have a good answer. When they're asked that question, they say, look at our community, it works. And that to me is very powerful because they don't have a lot of data, they don't have a lot of tests, they have a tremendous amount of documentation, um, and perhaps most important, they're a learning organization. In fact, when Mike McPherson said to me, what's a learning organization, I said, let's go to Reggio Emilia. And I think he saw a very, very dramatic example of that. And so, Reggio Emilia for me is a first example of a macroscopic or systemic view of this issue. The second exhibit is Japan, 1980. At that time, a book came out called Japan no as number one. Um, shortly afterwards, a, a book came out um, called A Nation at Risk, which you all know. Jap Japanese schools have not changed particularly, nor I would argue have American schools, and yet Japan is not seen as a threat in any sense to America. Um, and that's because I think the courses of the societies are not tightly linked to the, uh, le the, uh, um, the level and the operation of their schools. Indeed, my analysis of why 
America uh, has been doing so well over a long time is that we have immigrants, and this is not particularly a reference to my own background, um, and we, we encourage technical innovation. Statue of Liberty and Silicon Valley, and historically those have been much more important than the particular schools we have or the particular tests that we use. Incidentally, um, both Bill Gates and Steve Jobs dropped out of college, and I think we need to keep that in mind as well. The third exhibit um, is we've heard over and over again that the problem in America is really um, the kids in school, and particularly the kids in the inner city, the kids who aren't performing well, and there are millions, if not billions, of dollars going in to try to fix that situation. Of course, I would like to improve education for all children. That's not a debatable point. But let's look at what happened since 1980. Um, Enron, Lehman Brothers, AIG, most recently Goldman Sachs. These problems do not come from the kids in the inner city or indeed from the kids in the heartland. They come from the kids who are our children. And when I say our children, I mean particularly children in the Spencer family, um, probably more so than the average AFT or AERA person, but really kids who um, are the best and the brightest, but from my point of view, have lost a sense of values and have put the notion of uh, getting wealthy at all costs ahead of everything else. As many of you know, I've been working for the last 15 years on the study of good work. And good work I consider to be a combination of excellence, engagement, and ethics. To me, that's the right figure that we should keep in front of us, those three E's. I would say that in inner city, the issue has been excellence, and Dick has been working tirelessly on that issue. In the heartland, the issue has been engagement. Kids go to school, they get through, they may go to college, but they don't really care about using their minds. School doesn't have much of an impact. But it's our children, um, the children of the upper middle class, those who live in suburbs, what they're lacking is ethics. Um, they have been dominated by what I call the three M's of money, markets, and me. And my colleague Bill Damon, who's here, has been part of this good word exploration. And to my mind, that's been the wrong dominating figure in America over the last 15 or 20 years. Um, should we be caring about GNP? Should we be caring about what I'm going to call GHP, gross happiness um, product? Or should we be caring about how much good work and how much good citizenship we have? The countries that do the best in international comparisons, whether it's Finland or Japan, don't do well because they've been testing and collecting data for decades. They do well because they have a professionalized cadre of teachers and administrators who are respected, and because they have family and community which support learning. That's really the critical difference. So let me move now, in conclusion, to the microscopic level, that of the individual child. When I think of the individual child, whether in the inner city or in the suburbs, what I ask is, what, what is his or her role model, role model? What is his or her image of society? And I worry a good deal about the implicit or explicit messages in having such a focus on tests, data, failing kids, failing schools, rankings, rankings, and rankings. My friend Lloyd Thacker here is directing his attention to this issue. And um, Mike Foyer, another friend who's here, reminds us of the externalities which are often a casualty of that univocal focus. Le less work in history, less work in arts, less work in citizenship, de facto or real cheating, and deprofessionalizing, deprofessionalization of a cohort of educators. I want to make it clear that I'm not against KIPS, or Teach for America, or the Harlem Children's Zone, or even what Diane Ravitch um, sarcastically calls the Billionaire's Boys Club. Um, I think that they all are well-meaning, but as a psychologist, I think there's been a massive figure-ground confusion. The figure has been, insistently for the last 20 years, 
tests and data, tests and data, tests and data. And the rest of life, the kind of society we live, the kind of people we want to be, has receded so far in the background that in many of our most troubled schools, they're absent altogether. So I think the macroscopic needs to re-guide the microscopic, that instead of this domination of the three M's of money, markets, and me, we need to focus much more on excellence, engagement, and ethics. And when we do that, I'll be proud to be a member of the American community. Thank you. You're a tough act to follow, Howard. Uh, Howard. Uh, hearing Howard's words reminds me of conversations I had with, with uh, Ted Sizer over the last 20 years. I had enormous admiration for Ted and his work, as I know Howard does. The kinds of schools Ted was c committed to creating and sustaining, and I believe Howard advocates, are the kinds of schools all of the nation's children deserve. As many of you know, there were few more outspoken opponents of the use of standards of test-based accountability to drive improvement of American schools than Ted Sizer. Yet despite my admiration for Ted and for Howard, I reach a somewhat different conclusion about the use of standardized test results in the attempt to improve the quality of schools in this country, especially schools serving large numbers of disadvantaged children. So I want to use my uh, few minutes to explain why. And my view stems from, from a recent social and economic patterns. The first pattern is that the probability that a child born into poverty will be poor as an adult is higher in the United States than in virtually any other economically advanced country. This is a deeply disturbing pattern in our land of opportunity. And not one that's well understood, I believe. The second is that as a result of profound and lasting changes in the US economy, educational attainments and the skills that some children learn in school predict adult labor market earnings much more strongly today than they did 40 years ago. In other words, not having a good education is a much greater handicap in the United States today than it was in the past. The third is new evidence from research by Sean Reardon, who's here, showing that the gaps between the reading and math skills of children from families at the top of the income distribution and the reading and math skills of children at the bottom of the income distribution are wider today than they were 30 or 40 years ago. So uh, putting these trends together, I see the inability of low-income families to obtain good education for their children as a critical reason why socioeconomic mobility is so low in the U.S. today relative to other uh, countries. So the issue is not competitiveness. I mean, I agree with Howard. But the issue is the ability to have a democracy in which people see themselves as having a future when they are born into poverty. That, I see, is an enormous threat to our democracy in many respects. What's to be done about this problem? Well, a lot of things that ought to be done have nothing to do with our education system. Many, a great many of those are unlikely to be done. Providing all children, especially those from poor families, with the types of schools that Ted and Howard advocate should be part of the solution. In this respect, Howard and I are in full agreement. For that reason, I want the voice of Howard and others who express similar views to be heard widely and loudly throughout the country as we think about the future of education in the United States. Unfortunately, I don't think those, those voices by themselves will carry the day. One reason are Americans' views of education as, 
as Richard Hofstetter explained so well in his 1962 book, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, a great many Americans do not want the types of schools Howard and Ted advocate. A second reason is that the Founding Fathers created a political system in which local control of public schools dominate, and people with views of schooling very different from those of Howard and Ted have substantial power in determining what happens in local schools. A corollary of local control is that the, the uh, federal government historically has had very little influence on what happens in the nation's classrooms, as the frustration of Bobby Kennedy about what was happening to Title I money after 1965 so illustrates. Now, to my mind, in an important sense, No Child Left Behind, with its requirements of improving the reading and mathematics achievement of groups of, of disadvantaged high children, has changed this. While a great many people, including me, find aspects of the law deeply d d disturbing, I think the increased attention to the achievement of disadvantaged children is a singular accomplishment. I see this as a foundation on which to build in reforming the law. Moreover, I think that advances administrative record keeping and, and information processing creates the potential to bring a much wider range of data to bear in assessing the extent to which our schools are serving children well. Thank you. I'm going to start by telling a very brief story and then asking each of them a question. This time, Dick gets to go first. Um, I spent, all, as Mike sort of alluded to in very nice terms, I spent a lot of time last year uh, researching and writing about healthcare. And one of the most interesting things I did was spend a whole bunch of time at Intermountain, which is a network of hospitals in, mostly in Utah. Uh, and they are one of the most data intensive hospital systems out there. And one of the things they've tried to do is look at variation in medical treatment within their system and try to figure out why it's happening, where it can't be justified, and then try to root out the places where it's not justified. And they have a committee for each of, the, of their major practice areas. And I got a chance to sit in on some of the committee meetings. And one of the ones I sat in on was the labor and delivery committee meeting. And so they look at doctors' records and, and look at things like time of birth of, of these doctors and, and the like. And there was one doctor in particular who had very long average birth times and who also had a high, high C-section rate. And so they'd, and they tried to figure out whether he was treating a more at-risk population and the answer seemed to be no. So they'd written him a letter and basically said, you know, um, I'd, we'd really like you to look at the, these numbers as well and um, think about what might be causing this and see if we can start a dialogue. I mean, they're very, th th these letters that they write are, are, are very respectful and not aggressive, right? Because doctors have a huge amount of autonomy. So I was at the meeting after they'd sent the doctor the letter and the uh, chairman of the committee had gotten the response and no one else in the room had seen it. So the chairman of the committee said, well, I have the response here. Um, anyone uh, want to guess what uh, the major thrust of the response is. And I would say five people around the table called out, the data's wrong. And the chairman said, of course. That's what we always hear whenever um, we present someone with data criticizing them. The first thing we hear is the data's wrong. Um, and so I, I, that is, there is an obvious um, analogy to education. And yet sometimes we know the data is wrong. <laughs> and so I wanted to start off by asking them each to talk about the places where they feel most confident the data is right, where, where we should feel best about um, the data in, in the debate uh, over education, that it's telling us something real, even if we won't always agree about what to do about that. You know, I think it, the answer depends an awful lot on what you're going to do with the data. For example, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, I think, you know, the so-called a nation's report card provides extraordinarily valuable information. But there are no stakes attached to that. You know, one reason it's so valuable is that it's shown 
the, the problems with No Child Left Behind allowing each state to set its own exams, its own, own definition of proficiency, that, for example, uh, in uh, Massachusetts, a state that's invested a great deal of resources in developing standards and assessments, the percentage of students who on the, ma on the Massachusetts test are proficient is about the same as the percentage on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. In Mississippi, in contrast, the percentage of uh, students who were declared proficient on their state test is 82%, about 15% higher than Massachusetts. The percentage who was score proficient on the NAEP is about 18%. So again, it's very, I think the NAEP data is very important. I, I would go beyond and say, I think um, these value-added models, the, the attempts to estimate uh, teachers' contributions to kids' learning in mathematics and reading, I think they're informative for very much the kind of, of use that that you were talking about, David, in the sense that if, you know, one of the problems is we don't do evaluations well of all teachers, the way in most contracts it says that we should. We have limited oversight, time and resources. Where do you direct the attention? Well, I think if you see, particularly for a couple of years in a row, uh, very low estimates of kids' achievement gains for a particular uh, teacher, then it's worth asking, why? And it's worth looking closely. Again, it should be in this respectful way again, but you know, there are lots of possible explanations. One be that, that, that the classroom teacher isn't very good at what she does. And then the question is, is it something that you can remediate? It could also be because the politics in the school is such that that teacher gets the two or three most difficult kids in that class. Well, that's a different reason with a different outcome. It could be because that teacher has the kids who have a very high mobility rate. That could affect it. Or, or it could be that the quality of her colleagues is particularly poor. So there are many possible explanations, but I think it is useful to use the information to direct attention to figure out why kids are not thriving in that class. <clears throat> well, I have an awful lot of things to say, but I will try to be, be succinct. Um, first of all, I want to make it clear that I have nothing against data. You know, I spend my life in data of various sorts, and I have nothing against assessment, and I have nothing per se against tests. Um, with Dick, I'm always asking, you know, what's being looked at and, and how valid is it? I said 10, 15 years ago, I would have no objection to kids being assessed every year on the major things which you look at, if there were a different instrument each year and there was no way to game the system. Um, and in fact, when at least Dick and I went to school, that's kind of the way it was. There was a test, you didn't know about it. You, know, you had a little chance to figure out the format. But of course, what's going on now is the Mississippi example shows, is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, great, it's, it's smoke and mirrors. Um, and you know, every place is Lake, Wo Lake Wobegon. So I guess my succinct answer to your question is, if the measures are reasonably valid, and lots of them are, and if you don't rely on a particular format, but you get more at, let's say, you know, reading comprehension per se, or mathematical understanding per se, to me, to me that's fine and good. As for your example about the, the doctor, uh, I mean, I think that, you know, if, a doc, if they said you know, the data are wrong, and the obvious answer is, well, what data do you have, and on what basis are you making this decision? And if they have no answer, then it's, then it's ludicrous. Yeah. And the, I think the second answer usually becomes, it's the patients. Okay, you've persuaded me the data's not wrong. And the analogy obviously continues, right? You've yes, persuaded sure. me the data's not wrong, but I have sicker, poorer, more difficult patients. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what Dick has done, and uh, you know, I, I couldn't be more impressed with it. I think it's fantastic because he's sat down with, uh, with teachers in, 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 in Boston and try to help them use the data to become a learning organization. And you know, if, if that were done and the focus were on um, you know, improvement, value added, I mean, to me it seems that's the right way to go. Um, but uh, on the way to the Spencer Foundation meeting where Mike cooked up this, the idea of this um, session, 
I got this thing from US News, America's 100 Best High Schools. And this is a totally nonsensical document, and yet this league table way of thinking is so dominant that all the things which I think are more important, you know, to be a civil society gets, gets lost. Um, I love Ted Sizer. Um, we worked together for 10 years on the Atlas Project. We fought ardently about things because Ted was against the notion of any kind of a assessment across schools, and I said, I don't, believe, I don't agree with that. Um, but what I also said, and here's where, you know, where, where Dick and I might have a disagreement, that I think America ought to have six to 12 different pathways, K to 12. They ought to be present universally. So if you move from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine, you still have those pathways available. And they each ought to have their own sets of assessment because frankly, and this is why I'm afraid of national stuff, I don't want the sense of history or science to be dominated by Texas or Nebraska or a place where I think that, well, some of you are from there, but I wouldn't want your, <laughs> wouldn't want your educational standards. And Ma Massachusetts, you know, they're, it's, it's doing the best. Uh, I was going to save this for later, but since you mentioned it, let's do it now. Th this notion of educating students for a civil society, it seems to me that there are, in some ways, two issues um, that you're raising. One is the kind of education we have. Right? And, and your discussion of Italy contrasting it with the US. And the other is the extent and the way, the extent to which we measure that and the ways in which we measure it. And it seems to me those are two somewhat different issues. And I'd be really interested to hear you talk about how could we measure and evaluate whether we're doing a good job raising children to be productive members of a civil society. If we agree that we're not doing a good enough job on that, if we agree we should do more of that, how can we actually hold our own feet to the fire and be empirical about whether we're accomplishing that? Well, I think that um, this new move toward, uh, I actually don't like the total, uh, title, and I used it uh, somewhat uh, uh, ironically in my talk of, of, of gross happiness product, which, you know, Bhutan started it, France has now signed on it, and it's got the Nobel Prize imprimatur, and Derek Bach has written a very interesting book on the topic. I think looking at a wider range of signs of the society, which includes how many acts of violence, how much bullying, um, you know, how, many, uh, you know, how much desecration goes on in a school, and then I don't know whether Joe Kahn is here tonight, but some of the signs of, of being informed of um, uh, listening to diverse points of view. These are things which uh, you can take rough and ready counts for. They're not things that you need to uh, hire, you know, 20 uh, um, uh, psychometricians to create measures. But um, just as inspectors in an earlier time could reach pretty much consensus on which schools are working and which can't in terms of, you know, the overall environment of the school. Um, I've often said, uh, that I can walk into a school in America, not elsewhere, and I can tell within minutes whether there's an air of respect. And it has nothing to do with how I'm treated. On the contrary, if too much of a fuss is made about me, I'm quite, I'm quite suspicious. But you can't hide by watching how adults treat one another, on the, uh, what happens when the kid's running through the hall, those kinds of things. So I, I don't think this is rocket science, but it's gotta be something the community believes in. I didn't read the article, but apparently Obama's speech today was about respect. And you know, I mean, just turn on the television, it is absent. And when Dick says it can't all be done in the schools, he's absolutely right. Uh, I mean, it's very hard to make kids civil when you see nothing on TV except people screaming one another and you can't get, well, you all know this, you, you don't have to hear me on, on that topic. Can I just add, I mean, this is a point for Howard. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's for use of data, but to go beyond, there are, several studies recently that I think are quite intriguing about the impact of schools on long-term outcomes for the kids who attend them that don't show up in test scores. The one is the MDRC, Random Assignment Study of Career Academies. You know, Career Academies are these small schools within schools, and, and th in this random assignment uh, study, they found nine that had excess demand that were willing to do a lottery as to who got an invitation to attend the career academy and, and who did not. And they followed these kids, both those who won the lottery and those who did not, not only through three years of high school, but for eight years 
after high school. And the initial results were very disappointing. They found no differences in test scores at the end of high school, no difference in high school graduation rates, no differences in college enrollment rates. So how, how they got the, 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 the foundation is to continue to support that work is, <laughs> is another question. It's called uh, cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. uh, but they did, and the striking thing was, 11 years after they started this project, so eight years after high school, the kids who were in the, who won the lottery, were earning 11% more than the kids who lost the lottery. And the impact was, and these are almost all kids of color. And the results were larger for males. And if you know that literature, things to help a disadvantaged males have a quite dismal track record. The other piece was, there was, for males, a very big difference in, between treatment group or control group on the probability they were a living with the children whom they had born, mm. had stable relationships. So again, long-term outcomes. So I think it supports your point about you surely don't want to just look at test scores. That's surely true. But it also suggests uh, it's increasingly low cost to look at a variety of kinds of data, and we should be doing that. Yeah, and you know, David, I did a little bit of research on you. Uh -oh. um, and <laughs> I mean, two things which come out of your economic analysis is one, the notion of conventional wisdom becoming unimpeachable. You know, teachers are no good, schools are no good, teachers of education are no good, bring the business people and everything will be fine. And the notion of short-term goals. And to me, that's the most frightening thing about the test mania, is you gotta get the test scores up at all costs. And that's the message kids get. And somebody putting their hand on someone and saying, you know, I love you even though you didn't so well, those are the things which, 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 which are every bit as important. And I thought that Dick was actually going to mention the Perry Project because the Perry Project also had these softer signs which are very important. I mean, years later, these people had more intact lives. Yeah. I was in my kids' elementary school, which I think is a wonderful, it's a wonderful public elementary school. I think it actually does very well on a lot of these broader measures. But it's not immune from the testing. Uh, insanity. And I was walking uh, with my first grader uh, past a hall and started talking to him and he said, shh, kids are taking tests. And it was clear that there was sort of no higher, no higher purpose than taking a test. Well, that was respect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is Joe Kahn here? Hmm? No, there's oh, yeah. Joe? Yep. Tell the story about the email you got yesterday. It's, it's stunning. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to put in another plug for people to fill out their cards while I ask a question about teachers. Um, it, it seems like something that is now approaching conventional wisdom, at least in some circles, is the fact that teachers matter more than anything else. The quality of teachers matter more than anything else. And, and uh, in the popular press, we've seen this um, with two recent big magazine articles, um, which in many ways approached it from different directions. There was the Newsweek cover that basically said, we got to get rid of a lot of bad teachers. It's very hard to turn bad teachers into good teachers. And there was a cover in the New York Times magazine written by a Spencer fellow that talked about all the ways to improve um, the quality of teachers, or at least the early efforts to do so. 
I'd, uh, uh, we can get to that debate if, if you want to, but I'd actually like to start with the first debate, which is uh, how persuaded are each of you that teachers matter more than anything else? And how confident are you that we are beginning to have a sense um, for who the good teachers are? I'll let you fight over who starts. I'm willing to start with that. <laughs> uh, you know, again, it's this question of half full, half empty. I mean, I think there, there are now a number of studies that show that the, uh, uh, these, these results of the so-called value-added models and attempt to use longitudinal data on kids' test scores. Everything we know, by the way, is about elementary school uh, teachers. So we know almost nothing about secondary school <laughs> teachers in this regard. We're, and of course, our biggest problems lie in secondary schools. So that's a huge issue. But that basically, uh, the the results of these models tell you pretty much the same story as supervisors' evaluations done well. They can pick out the top and the bottom, and, and that's useful because uh, a lot of supervisors don't evaluate. Now. Um, the issue, though, is you got to be careful what you do with that. Because one of the striking results of a RAND study done a couple of years ago that looked at these value-added models and found after you correct for uh, differences in noise in the kids' test scores, and you look at the variation in performance of teachers from uh, across classrooms, fully half is consists of variation in the performance of the same teachers in different years. It's quite staggering, isn't it? Now, and I think there's, then you need to ask, there's lots of potential explanations for that. So I think the cup is half full. There's really some things that can be learned from this, but you gotta be very careful how you use that. Um, I have no doubt that teachers and teacher communities are the lion's share of the difference in uh, children's education. I have no doubt whatsoever about that. And when I used Finland and Japan, which are incomparable in almost nothing except the perceived excellence of their schools, uh, I said it's because the teachers are professional, treated that way, and there's support at home. Um, I loved the article in the New York Times by Elizabeth Green. I didn't know about um, Doug Lemoff, is that his name's yeah. work? I thought it was fantastic. If I was a teacher, I would have um, gobbled it up. Um, and I believe that uh, many, if not most, teachers want ardently to do a better job than, than they're doing now. Um, and anything that can help them, from his book to the data-wise stuff that uh, Dick is doing, um, I endorse 100%. Um, I was at a session like this with Michelle Ree, whom I've never met. And one thing about Michelle Ree is she's totally honest. Uh, and so I said, you know, do you think teachers can improve? And she basically said, no. We gotta get rid of the deadwood and get better people in there. And I think that's both wrong in human dimensions and it's unreasonable. I mean, if she's given $100 million, she may be able to you know, improve test scores and maybe even civility in uh, Washington, though I don't think she sets a particularly impressive model, but that's not, that's a nasty, that's a nasty, a nasty, a nasty comment. But um, I think in any polity, um, the more that we can do with the people who are there, not only to improve their skills, but to make themselves feel better about what they're doing. Um, because one of the, I mean, I have data too. We worked with um, teachers in the Good Work Project and teachers who were both excellent and ethical from everything we knew. And they, these were teachers working in inner cities. They burned out. They lost engagement because it was just too difficult. And that was a very depressing kind of result because usually when you're excellent and ethical, the engagement um, follows. And so, you know, improving those conditions uh, it seems to me to be an imperative, and that's why you know, I applaud everything that, uh, that, that Dick does, and I'm sure in a humane way, um, I think uh, for whatever reason, this is not Michelle Rhee's strong suit. Uh, Can I add some uh, comments? Uh, one is, I, I, I like that piece in the Times. Uh, 
with one exception. All the focus was on the individual teacher. And there was no question. And the reason that's a problem, there is a, a new study by uh, relatively new is, that's very nicely done that shows that the so-called value added, the contribution of individual uh, teachers, particularly beginning teachers, in raising kids' test scores depends on the effectiveness of their colleagues. And it's a well done study by two, uh, two young folks. And uh, that's, you know, that is missing entirely from that piece. But just one other comment. Um, you know, this term, database decision making, has, is almost a Rorschach test. It has very different meanings to different people. And, and I think it's important to distinguish at least among three possible uses, two of which I think make a lot of sense, one of which I think does not. I mean, the, the work that you know, the group that uh, we're involved in at Harvard in trying to help teachers to make constructive use of student assessment results, I think makes a lot of sense because it helps again, it creates a forum to change from learned-centered problem in, into instruction-centered problem. When you see that kids who teach uh, the same uh, kinds of kids whom, whom your school teachers do a lot better on certain questions, it leads you to ask, well, well, why? What can we do differently? And I, so that's, I think, con constructive. The second is using, again, the results of these kind of quantitative analyses to figure out where do you shine light that you see as a problem, like the high C section. But again, recognizing what you want to do is recognize you've got to do some detailed homework to figure out what the source of the problem is. I think that makes sense. What does not make sense is using the results of these test score evaluations to make high stakes decisions about how much teachers are paid or whether they get fired or not. But let, let me just say that um, when I was talking about Reggio, one of the points I was making is you, if you were looking for data in any American sense, it's not there. But if you look at the documentation and the teaching community, and maybe even earlier I said teachers and teaching community, that's what's, that's what's really there. And uh, in, the, in the paper you wrote, Dick, I, you also suggested that that was the biggest single factor for Teach for America success or failure students, was whether they went to a school where there were other teachers who could help and support them. And students pick that up. They pick up whether there's a community of people working together. That's what I meant by, by respect. And those things are data too, even though you know, they wouldn't pass uh, a dictionary test. See, I don't see that. See, you know, I want for all kids the kinds of schools that you want. I just don't see any way to get there. And, and I think with enough capacity, with enough investment, you can use the uh, pressure from well done standards and assessments like in Massachusetts to both raise kids' scores and do it in a way that in which the adults and the kids respect each other. And there are schools in Boston we both know about that do that. Unfortunately, there's not enough of them. But I think, I just don't see where the leverage comes other than through your articulate voice. When Howard was talking about Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs, I, I was reminded of the work of Annette Leroux, a sociologist. And I would imagine many of you know her work as well, looking at different kinds of kids, high socioeconomic status kids who are very well prepared to succeed on tests and to succeed in the conventional definition of success, but often lack uh, the kinds of communities that people have had for a long time. Um, they uh, lack strong ties in many cases um, to extended family. They lack strong ties in their own community. She contrasted this with lower SES kids who are often not very well prepared at all to succeed in school, to succeed in the workplace. But in fact, have these um, family ties in many cases that are actually stronger. They have been raised sometimes by uh, grandparents when their parents are off at work. Um, and so uh, the first question I'm going to get to relates to that. It's from Lauren Resnick. And it asks the two of you to focus on the needs of different groups of students and families. And so it seems to me, you can answer that how you want, but it seems to me that in this context what that means is um, where are we failing um, to to, where is our data failing? Where do we have too much of a one-size-fits-all approach to evaluating the quality of education, mm -hmm. given, how, given how high inequality is in this country today and how different students' experiences are? Well, I, I, I gave a kind of a one-sentence answer in my prepared remarks, but let me elaborate on it a bit. Um, when I was talking about good work, I said good work, which is 
my goal is a combination of excellence, engagement, and ethics. And then I went on to say I thought that if we parsed the American educational world into three rough categories, each of them has a different need. And so these are the things that I'd be working on. In the, in the inner city, the need really is, I use the word excellence, but it's the same kind of literacy that everybody in this room, and Lauren has been a leader in this, wants to produce. Um, and you know, a seriousness about using your mind. Um, in the heartland, and I'm, you know, I'm really, I know I'm being very gross, if not grotesque here, it really is engagement. School is seen as boring, um, and there's no real commitment to uh, using your mind for the fun of it or, for, or because you want to learn more things. And in the um, Leroux um, higher level communities, the ethics is really the issue. I mean, it's kind of an individualistic and a selfishness, um, which I think has been extremely damaging to the society, much more so than um, you know, the, the problems with the other, two, um, the other two groups. I do want to say, Dick, in, in response to your last point, um, I certainly don't believe that my articulateness or Ted Sizer's articulateness is going to be enough to, 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 to change anything, and, and it shouldn't be. One of the things that I got courage from in reading Diane Ravitch's book was to think about what um, I might change my mind about. And, uh, <laughs> I'm not, ready, I'm not ready here to support the E.D.R. Hirsch core curriculum, but I would actually like to see um, assessments across the board, not just in literacy, but in history and in, in other topics. And the arts is very complicated, and I probably know too much about, about that. But again, um, not having the same assessment every year, which you can practice for, and then using it for more kind of rounded decisions about where the school needs more, more, more emphasis. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, I want to make two comments. One is on this notion of different pathways that Howard spoke about. Um, I'm of two minds about that. Uh, on the one hand, I think uh, you know, this School to Work Opportunity Act in 1994 that spawned a lot of really interesting initiatives, then it kind of died on the weight of the of the, of, the t of the test based accountability. I thought that was a good thing. And I think these career academies are quite intriguing because although the, the rates for college were the same in the treatment control group, the rates were quite high. So, in some sense, the idea of this was not to prepare kids for the old vocational education jobs, but rather to teach the skills they would need in, to continue to learn, but to do it in a way that interested them. Um, the trouble with different pathways is, you know, Howard knows at least as well as I do the history of vocational education in this country, and uh, it's not a very happy history, it seems to me, and in terms of which kids got placed in shop. Um, so I'm of two minds. I, I, I think what I like about, I like the, the idea that all kids should learn to read, all kids should learn to do math so they can continue to function, but there are different ways of learning it, and as you've written so well, uh, scores on multiple choice standardized tests often do not measure skill, skill development uh, well. Uh, the thing I would like to see, one last point, this may be jumping ahead, but um, I'd like to see a waiver process in No Child Left Behind. So I'd like to see first. Uh, I, I'd like to see national high-quality exams uh, in core subjects. But I'd like to see waivers. For example, this is what, as I understand it, uh, Debbie Meyer uh, applied for in New York unsuccessfully with her schools, and she these schools that were doing these interesting exhibitions and senior projects. And that there's a history of this with, with, with welfare reform legislation in the 1980s. You had a federal welfare reform rules, but states could apply for waivers if they had an alternative plan they wanted to try. But a condition for the waiver was that there had to be a high quality impact evaluation by an outside agency. Well, a great deal was learned from those analyses of these waivers that informed subsequent legislation. Well, I think similarly, one of the strengths that we have this decentralized system is Lots of folks doing interesting things, but of course we rarely learn 
very much systematically about the consequences of those things. So I'd like to, and, but now that we have the capacity to follow at modest cost kids long, for a longer period of time, I'd like to see a waiver process tied to good evaluations. Now, let, let me just uh, make one, one clarification. You know, I've been supporting this idea of pathways for a while. I call it a policymaker solution, which is my way of saying I don't really think it could happen, even though it should. But I've never seen it as a, a kind of a vocational kind of thing. I've seen it much more, I'm going to use E.D. Hearst as an example. He says that you know, kids should know 5,000 dates, names, and faces. You know, it's in here. And the real question is whether you can look it up. But I don't want to spend my declining years fighting with E.D. Hirsch. If people want to go to a core knowledge school, fine, but I don't want to send my kids there. And I think in a large country like ours, with so many different aesthetics about education, there's no need. And in fact, when I put that idea out uh, at least 10 years ago, I also included the waiver idea. And I said 98% of places would never think of it, but I would give Deborah Meyer a waiver too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rebecca Jacobson from Michigan State asks, what data can we and should we be providing the public such that they can judge the success of their schools? Which seems a really important issue. It's easier at the high school level, I would think. I mean, you want to see uh, surely high school graduation rates, which is no mean trick to get those data accurately, as many of you, as many of you know. But, it, it, but I, th there's been progress in that. I think you know, percentage of kids who go on to college and succeed in college, that's much less expensive to collect now with this National Student Clearinghouse information. I also think we could get around the privacy regulations. You, you also could, could look at the, such things as the family formation outcomes and labor market earnings. So I think for high schools, there's a lot of things you could do to say how well are these schools, and I would focus on schools rather than individual teachers, preparing kids for life thereafter. I would try to get the Supreme Court to make it illegal to have any single ranking. I think that is the most pernicious thing. Um, and Lloyd Thacker, who's here tonight, is embarking on a project, I don't think it's a secret anymore, um, to, to counter the US News ranking, which I find very pernicious, with consumer reports to try to provide a plethora of information without um, valorizing and prioritizing one or two things. That's what I think is absolutely deadly. But the league table mentality is so powerful that it's going to take uh, you know, psychosurgery to get people to, to, to think differently. But I, I really think it's fatal to think anything as complicated as a school or even a teacher can be evaluated in one thing. In different places, they're, they're, uh, including for elementary schools, there's now a fair amount of data that you can look uh, um, you can look at for these schools, right? But this data tends to make no distinction between the input and the output, right? It's the kind of data that makes Harvard look like the best college in the country, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and so the question is, should we, would, what would you think of, for elementary schools, um, uh, setting aside for a second what they should be tested on, but maybe we shouldn't set that aside, I guess that's part of the question. What would you think about, um, publishing data, not federally mandating it, but publishing data where you could see um, some measure of how much kids had improved over the course of the year and allowing parents to look at that, which doesn't happen in too many places. Is that too league table-ish? Or is it giving people what they most want? You know, when you give students a grade and you write extensive comments, they only look at the grade. Um, in a good educational system, we need to get away from that single grade and give much richer, richer kinds of information. And in a very strong professional community, one could do that. You know, you can't fire all the doctors, um, but you know, you probably can fire all the air traffic controllers. And uh, it's it, it, it's a pain. But I I guess if there's one point where I think there's a real fault line this evening, and you know, we're we're all friends is I'm much, much more afraid of the abuse of data and of the misuse for a society which I think, whether it's in business or in education, just has a univocal way of thinking about things. And anything I can do to pluralize, to mess things up, to get people to think more rounded and more complexly is 
is good because at the end of the day, we want communities and societies work and not ones which, where the stock market is <laughs> over the top and then we find out that it's a house of cards. But I mean, I, I, you know, all the, the issues of values, is, uh, is I think you know, I, I share. I don't see those as inconsistent with an emphasis on uh, teaching kids core skills. Uh, and I thought of something else to say, but I forgot it. So I'll, I'll, it'll come back. <laughs> well, I have a good punchy question for you. Good punchy, uh, and it clearly starts with you. Um, uh, why do policymakers continue to ignore the data that show that standards reform has not produced student progress? Well, I, I, I wouldn't agree with that. I think it depends on which state are we talking about. I, I think Massachusetts has made, has made an quite remarkable progress. I can remember what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I wasn't... Uh, didn't spend a lot of time in Boston before the 93 the, the education reform law. But I've spent a fair amount of time there since then. And I would hazard a guess that education for kids of color in Boston looks a lot better now than it did in 1990. I think kids at least learning to write, you may say five paragraph essay is not the only mode of writing. I completely agree. But there's much more emphasis on, on writing. It's an absolutely critical communication skill. Uh, so I think, uh, I think it's been real progress in Massachusetts. Now, again, Massachusetts is at the top end, as we've said. It's one of the many things about No Child Left Behind that has to be fixed. My point is I think it's taken, it's much the strength of No Child Left Behind is it's gotten people to pay attention to kids who for a very long time no one paid attention to in American schools. I want to build on that. Yeah, I, um, I have not studied Massachusetts, but this is a place where I'm willing to accept the conventional wisdom. And maybe we can also set a standard of going beyond single measures and looking as we're beginning to do at other, at other subjects as well, and maybe in healthcare uh, as well. But uh, uh, one of the interesting things, uh, Linda Darling Hammond told me some years ago, if you take a look at the rankings of states over the last 50 years, I think except for North Carolina, uh, which has the, the, uh, um, the, the, the triangle, you know, it's pretty much the same. I mean, Texas is way up when you look at the Texas tests, but not when you look at and other things. And even the Harlem Children's Zone, the Iowa test is not particularly moving. It's the, it's the New York State. And we have to, the multiple measures are really important if you don't want to fool yourself. But I think that the NAEP Massachusetts things are complementary, but they might, be, they might have been complementary anyway. I mean, you know, they're, they're similar. Yeah. Yeah. And that's absolutely right. I mean, I think you know, a lot of the, I think, big questions on these high commitment charter schools that you know, a lot has been written about you know, their success in improving test scores is, you know, are they preparing kids to thrive in, in high school in particular? And to my knowledge, we know virtually nothing about that, which is, I think, a terribly important question. Um, uh, this next question is, what about NCLB is not working, and can it be disentangled from what's working? You covered some of this in your opening remarks, which is the idea that um, states get to set their own, um, their own bars. Um, but what else besides that? Uh, well, that surely is one piece of it. A second is, I mean, the algorithm is for, if, if, if for making adequate early progress is great focus on these so-called bubble kids. And that's been now quite well documented in Chicago and other places that that's where the, uh, where the attention of kids, of, of teachers goes because they're under pressure to do that. And uh, uh, no um, attention to helping kids who are, who, who are really struggling to make some progress even if they don't make proficiency. That's crazy on its, uh, uh, on, on its face. Uh, there's not, at the high school level, a requirement for a uniform measurement of whether kids are graduating or not. I think that, that ought to be done. There's some other things I've, I'll come back and think about. Okay. Yeah, um, I could not pass a test on No Child Left Behind. I will say that I thought all the changes that are hinted at 
we're in the right direction. But uh, I guess as a general point, I'm much less sympathetic to national legislation of carrots and sticks, phrases like race to the top. And I'm old enough to remember you know, gold 2000 and everybody would be proficient by 2014. I'd like to have some more honesty and some less and less kind of rhetoric. Um, but even I think people who would be inclined to agree with me are very afraid to change uh, this, this league table kind of mentality. Uh, when I'm talking to teachers, uh, and of course some people here are teachers, I like to quote Winston Churchill, who said, the American people always do the right thing after they've tried every other alternative. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's kind of how, if I were to come back in 100 years, and I look at No Child Left Behind, I may well see with Dick that it's been good for some of our most needy kids, but I don't think as a recipe for the kind of society I want to live in that it's a step in the right direction. I just don't. Uh, I'd like to see it more. I mean, this notion that uh, a school is only you either pass AYP or you don't, and that's irrespective of how many groups pass and how many don't, is a little bit crazy because, as I, uh, you, you can get school that's made great progress, and because it's got one small group of kids who don't, it's put in the same categories as the school that hasn't made progress with any kids. I think that ought to be altered as well. I, I just want to mention one thing about the league tables, which is I agree with you that the league table approach is really problematic. I think the concern that a lot of people who like data have is that once you, once you leave behind anything that resembles league table or anything that can be turned into a league table, you get into an area where you may have no accountability because there are no measures. And then you get into this Lake Wobegon idea that if we aren't measuring things, which quite frankly someone can always rank, <laughs> right? that if we aren't measuring things, everyone gets to say, um, I'm the best OBGYN there is, I'm the best teacher there is, I'm the best journalist there is, and, um, uh, and then we have another kind of problem. How do you try to deal with that tension so we don't yeah. go too far away from the lead table? Well, I mean, once, ever since this debate was inflicted on us, um, <laughs> uh, uh, and if we have a little time, I'll tell the story because it's kind of funny. Um, I realize that the debate is, is really about the best is again the best is the enemy of the of the good, and I'm Dick was right in the sense that I'm really a best kind of person, and um, good often gets in my way, but it's not that's that, that's that's not a sufficient. Well, I want your voice out there though. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's but, important. But, but to get to the heart of your of, of, of your question, David, I would love for educational entities to be able to put forth their own standards and how they're doing vis-a-vis -vis those standards and for those to be public and for them to be learning institutions. That's certainly what happens in Reggio. And I would like to think that in a highly professionalized community that what, that's what happens. I have our dean here and I love our dean. Everybody loves our dean. But we are rated on 50 different things, a checklist, and we're told which quintile they're in and it's a huge waste of time as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think in a professional organization, people ought to be said, what are your goals? How are you achieving them? And then some other people ought to look and see whether you're making progress or not. Um, and uh, you know, you may, if everything I've said until now, you've still given me the um, benefit of the doubt, you won't have the next sentence, but I'm going to state it because I'm among colleagues. Um, if five years after I finish teaching, students take away two things from me and some of my students are here. One, you should read the newspapers and connect that to what you're learning about. And number two, if somebody asks you a substantive question or writes you a substantive note, you should seriously think about it and give it an answer. That's much more important than if they know Piaget's stages or um, you know, even, even if they can cite the three E's of, um, of good work. Um, but you know, I'm I'm a lonely voice there as well. Mike, can I tell the story about how we got started? You, you may tell any story. <laughs> yeah. And I want to follow up on okay. this notion of the uh, court quintiles. Yes, and I have is, a different view. Okay, and this is this is the last thing I'll say. <laughs> um, I have been fortunate enough to serve on the on the Spencer board, and as a complete go away, complete throwaway line, without any preparation, I said, you know, when it comes to 
medicine, I'm with Gawande, but it, when it comes to education, I'm with Groupman. And the translation for that, for those of you who don't read The New Yorker uh, assiduously, um, which is not on my exam, um, is that Gawande is in favor of checklists and best practices and so on, and Groupman believes in the art and the craft of medicine, knowing the patient well. And actually, interestingly, he also shows that one quarter of best practices are rejected within two years, and half of best practices are rejected uh, within five years. But, and I have to thank Mike and Dick and um, David, I actually don't believe that anymore. I think it's much, much more complicated. I think a lot of Gawande, as for example in the Elizabeth Green, uh, Doug Lamoff stuff is very, very, very good. Um, and I think uh, that multiple measures contra uh, groupmen are very, very, are very, very important. But if I guess if I hadn't made that remark, we wouldn't all be sitting here tonight. <laughs> uh, Can I just comment on the quintiles? Uh, having worked for a time with Kathy in the dean's office, you know, one of the challenges uh, faculty, particularly tenured faculty, who think they teach wonderfully, and they don't. And, have, and we have mandatory evaluations now, and the fact that, that you can put those together and you can show a senior faculty that, uh, and a, that the students don't think you're very good compared to other <laughs> folks. That's an incredibly important piece of data to start that conversation. Otherwise, you're in exactly the same situation as the doctor. So I think they're very important. And now I'm going to jump in for one last thing, which is on the Gawande Groupman debate. Um, and I, I, to the extent that th these are real sides, I've certainly publicly sided with Gawande. So there's my bias. Uh, here's what I, there's a line in Groupman's book, How Doctors Think, in which he says he remembers every misdiagnosis he's ever made. And my attitude is, if you believe as wonderful a doctor as Dr. Groupman is, by all accounts, if you believe he knows every misdiagnosis he's ever made, <laughs> then he wins. <laughs> if you're skeptical of that, that even Dr. Groupman knows every misdiagnosis he's ever made, uh, then I think it's worth giving Gawande the benefit of the doubt. Well, uh, I regret having to bring this event to an end. Uh, I want to thank our panelists profusely for their work. And if indeed you feel that this was inflicted on you, gentlemen, <laughs> I think everybody in the audience would approve of my violent act. Uh, I, I want to say a word of thanks to our very diligent staff members who uh, spent the last hour cleaning the aisles and bringing the <laughs> results over to us for everybody's edification. And I want to remind you of our reception. It takes place immediately behind this curtain, but I recommend you not try to walk through <laughs> this curtain. But I think you can figure it out. So thank you again very much. Thank you. That was really a pleasure.